The following is a local resident producer's program. The program content is the sole responsibility of the producer and does not necessarily reflect the views or policies of Oshkosh Media, the City of Oshkosh, or your video service provider. to another edition of Ion Oshkosh. I'm your host Cheryl Hentz and very pleased to be joined tonight by someone who tries to join us at least once a year, sometimes twice. This year it's only been once though, our city manager Mark Roloff. Welcome. Thanks for having me Cheryl. You bet. Thanks for being here. It's that time of the year when you're having budget hearings and um, that's going to determine what the tax bills look like. I know now we're taping this on November 7th. Um, I know that yesterday you guys had a budget hearing. Did you have uh, some earlier in the week or was that, that the first one? That was actually the sixth budget workshop that councils had over the last four months. So, okay. uh, but it's, it's the final one. And okay. we had the public hearing. Uh, only one person showed up, uh, happens to be on your staff here. So, <laughs> uh, <laughs> so uh, and then council uh, had discussions about the operating budget as well as the capital budget and what priorities they want to set for 2020. Sure. So uh, what what can, now when are the bills going out? They usually, I think, don't they come out like around the first week or so in December so people have a chance to get their money together and, That's and come down and pay you guys? <laughs> yeah, we, you know, it's it's one heck of a holiday greeting card that we send to people. Yeah, usually, yeah. you know, your, your elderly aunt puts a few dollars in, we kind of do the opposite. That's not the, if we're not the most popular greeting card you get at the holiday right. season. But um, yeah, it usually goes out around the 1st of uh, December. Uh, the reason we're doing the, the budget hearings and the budget approval so early is so that there's time to get the bills out so that people can get them. You know, a lot of people are occupied with the holidays. Some people go away and they want to make sure that they have the bill and they can take care of business before uh, they head out the door. So we try to accommodate that as best sure. we can. Sure, um, Despite the message, right? Despite the message. <laughs> So let's talk about what, what we all can expect, those of us who own homes, um, in our mailbox this year. Are, from the city perspective, will the city's taxes go up at all? Uh, yeah, they will. The overall levy is going to be going up about 3.4%. Okay. Um, and uh, that's consistent with the last few years. Mm -hmm. the, um, you know, the levy, the, the, the amount we raise is over $40 million now. Um, we're only one third of the entire tax bill because the school district sure. and the Oak Tech district and the um, and the county also collect a portion of mm -hmm. it. Uh, but we're the ones that send it out. So usually people say, "Why are my taxes so high?" So we can only account for uh, a little over one third of our bill. Um, the uh, we did a little estimate of what it would mean for a one hundred fifty thousand uh, dollar priced house. And for a one hundred fifty thousand dollar house, it's going to go up about forty eight dollars for for the year. So uh, that's an annual increase. Um, we've done some additional analysis. We got a new finance director who is taking a different look on things. And our total bill for a property like that is about sixteen hundred plus dollars. And we took a breakdown and just said, how much is that per month? So it's about one hundred thirty five dollars a month. Now you can compare that to any bill that you get in that neighborhood. Um, so again, we give a breakdown with all the different services that you get for, for that $135. The bulk of it, or the, the, the largest one, uh, is debt service, and that's for all our capital projects. That's about 30% of the entire bill. So about $40 a month are for those capital improvements. Just under $20, uh, as you might expect, police and fire are next. 
Uh, and then public works, which includes uh, sanitation, recycling, things like that. That's third. So those are the traditionally what we call the big three, and that's pretty common. Sure. Uh, the library gets a lot of support, uh, and I think that's, you know, there's a lot of support for the library out there. Sure. Uh, we take a look at our services. We work with the university every year to do a survey, what people rank the highest in terms of importance as well as quality. Mm -hmm. And, you know, police and fire and public works have very high marks on importance. Public sure. Works does not get as high a rating on quality, and that's a condition of our streets, and we own that. We can't sit and hide behind that. That's that's legitimate. Sure. There's no surprise there, but um, we need to invest uh, and improve our streets and uh, and maintain the streets. So especially when you get snow in early November, uh, <laughs> that you know we've got to be out there. We we people can't say people aren't expecting us to say, well, we aren't expecting snow in early November, so we're not going to go out there. We go out with each and every snowfall. Yeah, well, yeah, and I want to talk more about the taxes, but let's let's just talk about that for a moment since you brought it up. We actually had snow around Halloween, and I think maybe we had a little bit of a kind of a dousing of snow, even maybe a day or two before Halloween. Um, so how are we sitting from a salt and brine standpoint since it came so early this year? You know, it really depends on what happened last winter because we're on a calendar year for budget, but uh, our winter season crosses fiscal years. Um, we're going to be over budget this year, and we expected that, and we made accommodations in other areas so that while that line item for, for salt and overtime went over, we made it up with other areas. Um, we're going to be a million dollars under budget this year overall, so we planned accordingly. Okay. Now, even though we had a rough winter last year, and it was late that we had it, um, I still insist that we have a full salt shed at the beginning of the season because we can't, we can't be unprepared. Sure. So our salt sheds are full, and we'll get a mid-winter refill of that salt shed that we've already uh, budgeted for, planned for, and we've signed a contract to get that. Because if you don't, then when salt supplies go low, you're running around looking for salt. Sure. And I don't yeah. want to be in that position. Yeah, well, and they're predicting a, a worse winter this year than we had last year. Yeah, so. and Old Richard's Almanac, you know, you look at that and say, okay, is it, what are we going to have? Yep. Regardless of how good or bad a winter might be, we need to start the season with full inventory of our salt shed. So we're full up, we're ready to go, sure. and we'll we'll handle whatever Mother Nature throws at us. Sure. Why do salt, salt sheds look so goofy? Why are they, like, built in such a way that's kind of pointed? I've uh, always wondered yeah. that. Yeah. Well, uh, part of it's filling because you want to make sure that um, it's, it kind of falls in that same cone style so you can load it and get okay. out, and then it falls into place. Okay. So we actually load it from the top. You'll see a little conveyor right. belt on the side that goes up, and it, it disperses in a conical fashion <laughs> and we we drive our trucks in there and we get them filled up and go out and then it just falls back in place so it keeps it it circulates the salt and we want it we want to circulate the salt sure. as well i've always wondered that you know when i was a kid growing up and we'd go down to chicago or whatever as a family i'd see their salt sheds and they all had this this cone shaped design and i'm like why but yeah. you always knew what they were. <laughs> oh, yeah, you always knew what they were. <laughs> yeah, that's right. So so I'm glad to hear that we're going to be in good shape with, with salt and brine and what have you. Um, so let's go back to the taxes. Um, we've certainly had a lot of new construction going on in the city. Why is it that we're not seeing that reflected on our tax bill? Well, part of it is, uh, well, it's twofold. One that, you know, we kind of take a little responsibility for is that some of the growth occurs in tax increment financing districts and that's restricted to to working in that that TIF district. Quite honestly our TIF districts amount to less than five percent of our full value so it's not a huge part of it. But the other part is one of our favorite topics Cheryl and that is uh, the dark store issue, the continuing here. reduction in commercial and industrial values. In fact, um, we only got our revised values last week, uh, literally a week before we had our public hearing, because the state state does all of the assessments 
for manufacturing. And there was still somebody protesting their assessment, and it ended up in another reduction. Our increase in value is, in our assessed value, is only about $5 million dollars for everything that you've seen, everything you've cited, all that growth on 41, all this growth in downtown, even there's a lot of stuff in downtown that's growing and that's not in a TIF district. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, think about all that stuff. You know, there was some talk about the granary, um, which, you know, Blue Door Consulting still there. That TIF is still very strong. Mm -hmm. Right across the street, that was not a TIF. The Lang family, they did that development. No, no, no uh, additional... Uh, uh, incentives or anything like that and that value gets added but then there's so many other reductions elsewhere that uh, a good development like that gets canceled out with uh, the uh, large big box stores claiming that their value just isn't as much and yeah we're kind of stuck so let's talk about the the dark store issues um, I had it on my list but further down um, maybe you can explain for folks who aren't familiar with it what the dark store issue is and the leap the loopholes that are in our legislative language well this, this goes back to uh the what was called the walgreens case it was walgreens against madison and then there was a second case and that was the city of oshkosh and walgreens stores sued uh the city of madison and they stated that their value uh that the city gave that the city of madison gave them was too high because it didn't reflect uh, the fact that there, there's a special building to that. Um, I don't know what's special about a cube, um, <laughs> but, it, but there's a cube building and they claim there's all these specialties. But the year before it had sold for exactly what the city of Madison assessed it for. And there are three standards upon which an assessor values. Uh, one is a lease revenue, the, the income approach, the uh, market value approach, which is basically what it sells for, and then the construction value, what it costs to build it in the first place. And you can you usually take a look at all three approaches, uh, but most more than likely you take a look at the, the market approach, which makes sense. That's what yours and my property is based sure. on. If I buy your house from you for, for $100,000, you're going to get assessed for $100,000. That just makes sense. Uh, this, this, these buildings had sold for four and five million dollars, and they said, "Oh no, ours is only valued at two million. Yeah. It defies logic, but they convinced the courts that somehow we were or that Madison was overvaluing, and this, it went all the way to the state Supreme Court, and they ruled uh, in Walgreen's favor. And the legislature has subsequently refused to take up the issue. It's been introduced, but it's never made it to it's not even made it to the floor of the assembly for a vote. It's passed in a committee, but then the Speaker of the Assembly refuses to schedule it. That's the Walgreens case. The dark store is sort of an offshoot of that. The dark store logic is that uh, a property that is thriving should be based on not its current value, but its future value when it's exhausted its usefulness and it's, it's, it's dark. It's no longer useful. Um, for example, the Lowe's store in town, they wanted to use um, an old American TV store from uh, to the north. And I'm not talking about the old one in Grand Chute. I'm talking about the really old one that had been in the town of Menasha back in the late 80s and early 90s. Wow. And they claimed that that's what the value of the Lowe's store in Oshkosh should be. <laughs> and... It's just, it defies this logic. Is a, this is a family show, so I will refrain from the profanity <laughs> that should accompany that statement. <laughs> but it makes no sense. Yeah. And it doesn't reflect the market and how much they paid for that property and how much they paid to build it. And what it's, and sometimes there are these leases that uh, you, the, the business will lease it from a holding company, which is their own company. Yeah. And they're paying lease revenue based on the, the market value. And so why they should be assessed for less just makes no sense. Yeah. But the um, other states have adopted that dark store approach and it's, it's really hurt. Cities in Michigan and Indiana have really been impacted huh. by this. And we're fighting that and there was some compromise that they wanted to maybe, well, we'll, we, we'll let the dark store thing go away, but we want to keep the Walgreens case 
but when that property is uh, that valuable and is generating that much market value, the, the market value is not for the inventory, the prescriptions, or the stuff in the store. Mm -hmm. it's, for the, it's for that store. And a cube is a cube. There's no uniqueness about that. It's, it's, a, it's on a great location. And those drug stores love, the pharmacies love to be at very accessible locations. Sure. Look around town. Everyone, I'm not going to do a commercial for them. Yep. They're, they're all like a big, big visible corners. That's because that's where they want to be. Sure. And they're the most expensive and they generate a lot of income. Yes, so they, do. they argue that, well, you shouldn't be taxing the business, you should be taxing the value. Well, that's what we are doing. We're <laughs> taxing the value. So this results in our property values getting reduced while you get all this other building going around. Yeah. And so you get a big increase, but you get a big decrease, and our total value is over $4 billion of, of market value. That's how valuable all the property is in Oshkosh. Yeah. We went up $5 million. That defies logic. Yeah. So who are some of the players um, who are utilizing this dark store um, loophole? Lowe's? Well, all of the pharmacies, so Walgreens, CVS. Okay. Um, Lowe's um, is probably one of the bigger ones as well. Mm -hmm. uh, Walmart hasn't started it yet, at least in this area. Um, I think those are the biggest ones so far. Um, I'm trying to think if there's any other ones that have that have done that. Uh, I don't want to. I don't want to besmirch any other business. I'll, right. I'll tell you who they are, but I, that those are the ones that have been those the biggest are the big ones. ones. Yeah. And you know, and they're ones that, like CVS and Walgreens. If we don't use them, we've got a few small family-owned or like hometown pharmacy. I, I think is one. Um, I can't really think of any other little pharmacies in Oshkosh that you could go to. Let me use that as an example, Cheryl, because think of a hometown pharmacy. And, you know, certainly we are our, our hometown. It's, it's a locally owned yep. business. You know, we certainly want to help them, but we don't want to hurt them either. Right. And when they're paying taxes on their property based on the market value and a CVS or Walgreens does not, Walgreens and CVS are getting a distinct competitive advantage. I believe the state of Wisconsin is giving competitive advantages to one business over another, mm -hmm. and they're hurting the small businesses. Yeah. Of all, yeah. I mean, it just, again, it defies logic, and uh, to not recognize that, I think, is uh, patently unfair because what happens is those values are depressed or pushed, artificially depressed. You and I, the shift of the property taxes get shifted from commercial to residential. So that's a shift. Now, I gave you the example of, oh, it's only going up about $48. Mm -hmm. But if there's a shift, it's $48 plus the shift. I'm not counting the shift yeah. when I give you that. I'm just giving you, it's average $150,000. But if your share of the pie is now larger, you're paying more, so sure, of I, I, you know, there's always a you know a caveat with yeah. with my statements because there's so many other variables, but that shift is going to increase your property taxes as well. Sure, so maybe people should be going to the the hometown pharmacy locations, and I know that there's a grinding pharmacy in Amro where they actually grind a lot of their own um, medications, and you can get drugs very inexpensively there. I don't know the name of it offhand, but I'm sure if someone puts something out on Facebook or Twitter or whatever, you'll find out who it is. Um, so, you know, I mean, it, it kind of makes me not want to patronize those stores because they're taking advantage and, again, putting more tax debt on our backs as the citizens. One of the best examples that uh, somebody made a presentation to the assembly when this was being discussed and I, I started running some numbers and you know they talked about well you know they don't use as much police we ran some numbers for some of our bigger stores Fleet Farms another one I hate to say it but Fleet Farms another one on that list um, and we took a look at the numbers of calls that we make to those locations those big box stores and 
versus an, a true empty store, the old Kmart site before it was redeveloped. We may get three or four calls to that site a year where we get seven, 800 calls a year to these other stores. I mean, because of shoplifting, what have you? Yeah, any you know anything. I mean, it okay. could be you and me falling. I mean, it's not that it's it's yeah. all about crime, but our public safety people do more than just respond to crime. Sure. And so you know, somebody falls, or you know, they're they're uncertain about something. There's a somebody leaves a backpack sitting there. Yeah. Our folks do all that stuff, mm. and it's and we have to, and we should. I'm not saying that we shouldn't do those things. It's just that that is a cost of their existence, and they should be paying their proportionate share mm -hmm. of the taxes. And they aren't. Pretty well, much. Well, we have to get the uh, Speaker of the Assembly to get it on an agenda so there can be a vote taken. S over 60% of the Assembly and Senate are in favor of, dar of Dark Store and Walgreens case reform. 60%. So why is the speaker, you know, not wanting to do this? If there's a, you know, I, I mean, 50% and 50% would be, well, okay, maybe we should, maybe we shouldn't. But when you have 60% saying, we think this needs to be done, why is the speaker not listening? What's uh, wrong with him? I think the speaker buys the line from the WMC, the Wisconsin Manufacturers Council, the state chamber, where they, they've, they're convinced that this is bad, and so Speaker Voss just buys that line, hook, line, and sinker. If you take a look at his statements, they are identical to WMC's. Huh. Now, the cynic in me says, you know, follow the money and see where donations are. Um, I don't know any facts on that regard, but if you follow the money, there, there might be some answers you there. You usually can follow the money and find answers. Yeah. So I, I totally agree with that. Well, let's talk about some of the uh, construction that's been going on around town. Um, the one I think people are most excited about probably is Mineshaft. I mean, this was something that um, had been proposed. Uh, he'd wanted to bring it to Oshkosh um, for years and years and years. I think even predating when you came here. Oh yeah, long before me. Because he, um, the one site for sure he wanted to be at was in the 100 block of, of Main Street. Um, and that didn't happen for a lot of different reasons. Um, but he's, he's had Oshkosh on his radar screen for many, many years. And uh, for folks who aren't aware, uh, the Mineshaft is a, a wonderful restaurant. Um, they're currently in, what city are they in right now? In is Hartford. It? Hartford, yes. Biggest restaurant in the state. Is that right? Oh, yeah. Wow, I did not know that. Yeah, about 800 seat restaurant right in wow. downtown Hartford. Uh, an cow. entire block of old storefronts. They just kept buying storefront after storefront and knocking down the walls wow. or... Yeah, it's it's really it's a site. How many hold. seats will this restaurant have? Here? I believe it's going to have four hundred. Okay, it, so about I half think that originally it'd been but a little. Still, it's it's going to be big. That's going to be the big. It's still going to be the biggest restaurant in Oshkosh. Yeah. So they 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 like having a lot of room, a lot of volume. Yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. And if you haven't had a chance to see where it is, it's it's in the old Walmart place, which is in where Rogan Shoes is, where J C Penney was where a lot of different stores were once upon a time. But, um, you know, it's fascinating to see how quickly it's starting to, to go up. Yeah, it sure so. is. And so that, that's that been one long time coming. Uh, there's some weird rules around the airport where... Yeah, you, the airport overlay. The airport overlay. So you can't put places of public assembly. So uh, a restaurant, a restaurant's allowed on the footprint where uh, the mine shaft is identified because it's just outside of it. Uh, and that's why the other uh, businesses there are not considered places of public assembly. Rogan's is going to continue to go there. And Extreme Customs, which is a, a customizing company for vehicles, is going to go there and have a little showroom and, and, uh, and expand there. And uh, they're also allowed in that area. But hotels, office buildings, I think there's opportunities for that. And we're going to take a look at that in the long run because we think... Uh, it's still underutilized, and I think mm -hmm. you can coexist. Yeah. You know, you think of you know flying into different airports, and you see all this development as you're landing. You know, it's it's not impossible. It's just a matter of how you um, how you accommodate that from a mm -hmm. safety and a noise standpoint. Sure, sure. 
Well, I think, um, I, you know, I think a lot of people are excited about that. I, do you know what their timeline is? When do you think they'll open? Uh, I think their goal is probably to be open by EAA. You know, you know okay. get, get lots of customers in there, and, and, yeah. and that's a good way to open. Those of us who live here may not be able to get into it until August or September. <laughs> <laughs> My advice is lunch. Yeah. <laughs> well, lunch is always a good thing to, to split up the day. What else is going on around town from a construction or an economic development standpoint? Well, you know, I, I have a personal favorite myself. It just happened this past Saturday. There was an announcement, uh, the Oshkosh Food Co-op is yes. going to be one of the anchor tenants to what's called the merge development. And that's, it's sort of an awkward shape. It's mostly along the river from Jackson Street uh, west towards where the apartment complexes for the rivers uh, and that are. But it, it juts north a little bit uh, along Jackson. And at the corner of Jackson and Pearl, uh, there's going to be a four-story uh, mixed use, which... Uh, the top three stories will be apartments that Merge Development will uh, sell, or excuse me, uh, they'll rent out. But the bottom floor is going to be the Oshkosh Food Co-op. They announced that Saturday. Uh, they had a little, a very cold uh, announcement meeting at that. And, you know, I'm very excited about that. I think it's going to do a lot to um, add vibrancy to the downtown. It's going to resolve a very uh, serious, but kind of under understated problem of what's known as an urban food desert. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, there are no full service grocery stores right. in easy walking or biking distance of downtown Oshkosh sure. on either side of the river. <clears throat> and so, the grocery store down there has been talked about for years. For years. And I think from a, from the standpoint of a for-profit business, I kind of understand. I mean, mm -hmm. it's that they like to get volume, volume, volume. Yeah. The co-op can work a little differently, and the profit is not the motive. It's more about meeting community needs, and this is a nonprofit entity. Um, they've got a thousand members, and I'm happy to say I'm one of them. And once they reach the thousand, then they are now starting the true fundraising effort to raise $1.6 million, and they've already raised 250000 and their their goal is to, I believe, by the end of the year, uh, have the $1.6 million raise, and I wish them the best of luck. Um, that'll be a great anchor in the downtown. I think uh, people uh, looking to locate in downtown Oshkosh are going to see a grocery store as an incredible amenity. Mm -hmm. I mean, what's easier than... Uh, Having it, 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 the only thing easier is having it in your own refrigerator. Right, right. So I, I think it's going to be a great addition to the downtown. All of the uh, apartment complexes and the university community, um, the students and oh, yeah. the faculty in that immediate area are going to be able to take advantage of it. Yep. Uh, it'll be you know reasonably priced. Uh, Focus is on um, local produce now obviously in winter that's not going to be as much but the idea is to right. maximize the amount of local produce they're going to do things like teach you how to cook things that maybe you didn't know how to cook um so lessons in that um uh you know prepared foods that you can quickly for you know people on the run you can get that so there'll be lots of different options um it's uh it's very exciting it's kind of they're kind of like a whole food, but a little more homey, yeah. uh, without without the corporate thing going on. Yes, yes. Um, so I'm excited. I think this um, says a lot about the Oshkosh community. We will be the first co-op in all of Northeast Wisconsin. So I think that that says a lot about our community and recognizing that this is something that will benefit everybody. Not too many downtown grocery stores. Uh, and and certainly a food co-ops nowhere nowhere in this region. Yes, absolutely. Uh, let's see. What else can we uh, touch on from an economic standpoint? Well, you know, the, uh, the, the one that's still not talked about a lot is out in the Southwest Industrial Park is the uh, rail transload facility. Hmm. And quietly, Wisconsin and Southern Railroad is becoming our best real estate agent. Hmm. They are identifying customers who uh, want to access rail uh, but they can't necessarily do it because they're not adjacent to rail, and they're not interested in necessarily moving, um, but they want to get their product to market quicker, and rail offers that option. 
uh, some of those customers where are interested in purchasing places where they can warehouse product, wait for the rail to come in, and then load it and get it out, uh, get it out on the tracks and to market quicker. And the transload facility enables uh, these businesses to get their products to market quicker and a lot cheaper. Okay. Rail is much more cost effective than than trucking it. Uh, so they've been quietly selling properties or you know, hooking us up with people who want to buy properties in the Southwest Industrial Park. So that's a, a, a big success. So we're real happy about that. Excellent. Um, you, you know, we're getting uh, people interested on the north side with, uh, again, some more apartments. Uh, and on the west side, we're getting a smattering of single-family residential. Not a ton, mm -hmm. um, but we're getting a smattering of it uh, immediately north and west of Traeger uh, Elementary and okay. those schools. All right. Okay, good. Um, and of course, uh, you know, we have to talk about Oshkosh Corp getting settled in their new building um, along the lakeshore. How's that gone so far? And, you know, what are your initial reports, if you will, from people regarding whether there's a traffic problem or a noise problem or just problems in general? Yeah. So far, uh, it's been going very well. They had a quiet uh, opening. Uh, they've located most of their people already. So if you haven't noticed it on Oshkosh Avenue, it's just quietly done that. I think we put enough traffic features in there that the impact uh, isn't really noticed. Uh, you know, we did some studies beforehand and we expanded one of the uh, lanes to enter the roundabout at Keller from uh, widened at the southbound uh, just north of Highway 21, Oshkosh Avenue, and that seems to have gone okay. Um, I haven't noticed anything on my afternoon commute. I've gone that way just for to check it out. Yeah. And so, no, it's fine. And it's an office building, so the noise is is virtually yeah. minimal. Yeah. Um, I've gotten a lot of great comments from people traveling south on I-41 who notice it, especially with it getting dark earlier. It's like, oh my gosh, that looks great. Um, I had an opportunity to tour it last week. Um, it's different. I, gu I guess maybe I'm putting myself into old school. It's <laughs> very modern in terms of very open concept. Desks are, you know, people are working as close as you and I are right now. Um, it's, it's fascinating how there's a different approach to this, um, but people seem to like it. So yeah. that's, that's their thing. And they've got these collaboration areas. So even though we're working next to one another, if, the, if several of us need to get together, rather than bother everybody around them, they've got rooms with couches and, you oh, know, wow. and Wi-Fi so they can bring their tablets or whatever and, and do their thing there. It's a different world, isn't it? It is a totally different world. And, I, you know, I, you know I, I know it's not just them. That just seems to be the way business is going these days. And, you know, you're getting a lot of millennials working in these environments and they're, they're catering to them with the way their offices are set up. And well, you know, even at the school level, you know, it, 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 as a parent, you go kind of crazy. It goes, oh, why is all this team stuff? You know, my, my kid needs to, you know, make it on their own, everything. But when you get into the working world, you're working in a team. Yeah. And so it's like, okay, I'm getting this a little better. So, yeah, yeah I got I to gotta quit being such a fuddy-duddy. Well, uh, I don't think it's being a fuddy-duddy. It. It's just what <laughs> you and I are accustomed to. Um, although, you know, when I was in the working world and not just self-employed, yeah, I was in a, a cubicle, you know, kind of environment, and I didn't like it. You know, it's it for me. It was too noisy. You yeah. know, you can s sit there on the phone and you can hear what everybody on the other side and across the way was was saying, and it, it, I didn't like it. And so I said, I'm going to work from home, <laughs> and that's what I did. Well, I'm excited because this is a showpiece, and as Oshkosh Corporation brings in. Uh, prospective employees, it's going to blow them away. And mm -hmm. they're going to go, wow, this is really, it, it says something about the culture of the organization that they're willing to invest uh, in a location that their employees say, this is, you know, take pride in their workplace. Their customers are going to go, wow, this is really something. So that's going to, and that's going to reflect well on Oshkosh. 
And even though we haven't seen a ton of development in the immediate area, there's lots of buzz. And I'm okay with it being slow because the plan commission and the council have set some high standards. And we want to maintain those high standards. And if we just throw anything in there, it doesn't, it doesn't get developed commensurate with the investment Oshkosh Corporation has done. And we're not going to get our payback from a taxpayer standpoint unless everybody helps rise that tide sure. for, for, for all the sure. ships there. The Casey's store there, regardless of your opinion on Casey's, that is the best looking Casey's store they have, hmm. bar none. We took a look at one in near their headquarters in West Des Moines, Iowa, and we said, well, we like that, and we'd like a couple more things. Um, and they were willing to do that. We were, they are were very cooperative. And other potential purchasers understand that that's the standard that we want to set. Um, we're not used to that. We're just kind of used to, well, it'll be okay. But we have a higher standard in this area, and, and I think that that's appropriate. We have a true Class A office building. You'll hear people, you'll hear people talk about Class A office, and you know it's like, oh, this is Class A. Well, I know you want Class A uh, pay for that. This is total Class A. I'd say Class Double A. I don't think that exists, but run with it. We'll make it. We'll make it. We'll make it that way. It truly is, and it's going to set a standard for for the area, and it's going to reflect very well on the Oshkosh sure. community. Okay, good. Um, so what are the plans for the rest of the parkland over there? I, I know it just hit um, the Oshkosh Herald this week, um, but for people who maybe don't get the paper or haven't seen it yet, uh, tell us about the plans for the rest of the parkland that Oshkosh Corp did not buy. Well, there's, you know, uh, Oshkosh Corp is kind of in the middle, and so there's east and west <coughs> of uh, Oshkosh Corporation. Um, to the west, um, because we don't have a ton of utilities out there, that's going to be more focused on natural uh, space uh, for people to enjoy. And the benefit of that is that if you don't have to put a lot of utilities out there, you're not going to have to spend a lot of money. More natural, so that's what you're going to see there. On the east side, it's taking advantage of the proximity to Rainbow Memorial Park. Um, it's proposed to have like a four season shelter, which I think is awesome. We don't have anything like that. Right. Um, and it's close to and it's close to the water. There are utilities already there, so that won't really be any significant additional costs to just, you know, plug it in. And so that's that's very exciting. And then a variety of other amenities uh, in and around there. But that's kind of the but more developed on the east side, less developed on the west side. And then the trail on the north side, which uh, is almost done, uh, save for a couple bridges that this darn weather uh, didn't do us any <laughs> yeah, favors. Sure. Uh, and then we also encountered some environmental contamination that, you know, probably from some old, uh, it was a dump there for a while. Mm -hmm. Way, 100 years ago, it was a dump, and we found some petroleum contamination. So that slowed that part of the project down, okay. but we'll be okay. Um, by spring, we'll have a nice uh, trail that people will be able to enjoy from from Rainbow, uh, well, from Rainbow Park all the way over to the um, uh, Butamore Bridge, which will just be wonderful. Okay, great. Um, and I know that they came across a bunch of artifacts in this whole process. What's being done with those? Are they going to be, um, you know, given to the museum for some kind of special display, or what's the thought? Because of the heritage of the site, they actually belong to our indigenous peoples. Okay. And the reason I use that term rather than a specific tribe is the various tribes are taking great interest in this. Fortunately, we don't have to make we don't have to make that decision. The State Historical Society, UW Milwaukee, who okay. we contracted with, they will decide which of the tribes get which. And I'm happy I'm not part of that. Uh, but they have taken a great interest in it. And so we're, uh, but the artifacts are at UW Milwaukee. They've been dusting them off. Think of Indiana Jones, cleaning yes. it all up. They're <laughs> cleaning it all up and just making sure that, you know, document it and everything. Uh, there were human remains found more than um, what we originally thought. They were like, oh, we found some more. As they were cleaning things off, it's, no, this is human remains. Sounds like they have eight distinct individuals that they've been able to identify wow. from what they excavated. So, huh. you know, we're, it, it's a great history 
um, yeah. collection that we have. Yeah. Now the rest of it's still there, still buried, and will stay there. Um, but this area, because that was disturbed as part of the Ashcorp site, um, we uh, we have that. And now the the indigenous uh, tribes can uh, decide who whose is whose. They can fight over it. Yeah. Um, moving east down Oshkosh Avenue to the Oshkosh Avenue slash Congress Avenue bridge. Um, now, I had originally heard that there was supposed to be work done on that bridge this past summer. That didn't happen. Um, then I heard that it was going to happen in the relatively near future. Is there still work that's being planned on that bridge that's going to put that bridge out of commission? Oh, absolutely. And when? <clears throat> when are we looking at? We're probably looking immediately after the first of the year. Literally, I believe it was today, the state was going to open the bids on that. So it's a state project. The bridge is the, bridge is the state's responsibility. It's on a state highway. So they were opening the bids. And so we're projecting that the state will probably start work in January. And so the bridge will be closed for five months for at Ugh. least for vehicular traffic for you and me. Um, I mean, the first two people I called, I, I, I let Oshkosh Corp know because yeah. they, they open up and then we close one of their access points between their um, defense plant and their headquarters. And then also, you know, all my friends in the immediate area around uh, Fox River Brewing and, and, uh, and the dental, all those areas. It's like, well, one of the things you were happy about having Oshkosh Corp so close, they're going to have a long drive to get to you for the first few months. So, um the idea is to get as much done so that the boating traffic, when boating starts on May 1st, that the boating traffic will not be impacted. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. the idea is that the, I believe the bridge will be up throughout May, uh, and I'm, they don't have a definite date set, but that's the plan. It was supposed to be closed this summer for some pre-work, but the businesses in that area you know, called us and, and asked us to um, kind of advocate for them at, at the state level, and, and we did. We're like closing, you know, that bridge during the day for these businesses that rely on summer traffic just doesn't make sense. So they actually closed it a couple weeks ago. It was just during the day. It was for six days, and they were done. Mm -hmm. So it okay. sounds like it, you know, it went very fairly quietly. Yeah. Um, but, you know, the businesses sure felt it for those days. So for five months, it's going to be, you know, it's going to be slim. Mm -hmm. uh, so, you know, uh, spot, or, uh, uh, buckle up and, and you know, uh, go to those businesses. I Whenever they're closed, you know, or whenever their their access is, is closed or restricted, you know, make sure you patronize local businesses sure. who, uh, who are, you know, putting up with a lot. Absolutely. Uh, sometimes more than their fair share, really. You know, it was it was disappointing for me as a citizen to see our common council um, elect to not, uh, you know, to go the route of reconstructing these bridges and repairing these bridges as opposed to tearing them down and putting up higher bridges that weren't draw bridges. Uh, you know, boats could get under them easily. Um, we wouldn't have traffic being slowed down because of opening and closing bridges all summer long. And you wouldn't have as many repairs because you don't have any mechanical parts that can fail. Um, it, it, they didn't do that. Do you know why they didn't do well, that? I will, number one, defend the council for two reasons. Number one, they're my bosses, so don't put me, get me in trouble, okay, all right, okay. But secondly, <laughs> they're not our bridges. Uh, the state will take input from us. Okay. And But with the Wisconsin Avenue Bridge, there was never any such input sought. It was going to be a mechanical opening. The Jackson Street Bridge is one that, that you can ask about. The Congress Avenue Bridge isn't a full reconstruction, so... It, we were never asked for input. We were yeah. we were told we're doing some major maintenance repairs on the bridge in 2020, and uh, really the only input they wanted from us was, do you want anything done with the uh, bridge approaches? Because once they get past the abutments, it's ours. Yeah. So we said, well, yes, we would. That was the only input we got. The one you're probably referring to is the um, the uh, Jackson Street Bridge. Yeah. And there was a mixed uh, opinion on council. My recommendation to them was to try to be as forceful with whatever they wanted to do. 
and it, it passed on a 4-3 vote, so it, it wasn't a strong uh, decision to council, and ultimately the D Department of Transportation determined, well, we're going to wait to do the bridge anyway, so we'll call you again in five years, and you can, you can debate it again. Right. So we're probably not looking until the latter half of the next decade before we do the, we do the project or the state does the project and we will um we'll probably won't be asked for our input and probably until about 2022 okay all right. I want to uh, follow up on the water bill situation. Um, you know, a couple months or so ago, um, there was a, a public meeting that you guys held um, on the water bill issue, and it was fairly well attended, I thought. Um, but, um, you know, there's still, I think, a fair amount of cynicism out there, Mark, as far as, um, you know, why these bills were so high. Um, and in reality, I don't know that they really were that high. It was, you know, prorated along with their current bill and that kind of thing. You can much better address that. But the one thing in particular that I wanted to follow up on was um, there was a woman at the meeting, and she asked about the city being able to do a budget for the water bills, much like Wisconsin Public Service does yeah. for our utility bills. Um, have you guys looked into that, and what's the status of, of that? Um, that was a great idea. I mean, it, sometimes when you're asked a question that's so common sense, you just kind of get blown away. We're like, wow, okay. <laughs> um, I've never seen it at a locally regulated utility I'm not sure if that's because it's water and it's treated differently. We're researching it right now. I'm certainly open to it, absolutely. Um, uh, the, the issue is will the Public Service Commission allow us to do it? Mm -hmm. Technically, we only need Public Service Commission approval for water. We don't need it for sanitary sewer or storm sewer. Okay. But to do budget billing on Two and not the third wouldn't make a lot of sense. Yeah. So, um, the the um, the public service commission was kind of taken aback, and we're like, they haven't given us a definitive answer yet. So mm. we're going through a rate increase process, and we're just going to incorporate it into our request. Another rate increase? Oh yes, I mean our our continued oh, investment. You know, paying for the water tower, paying for we've got hundred year old water mains that we are still replacing so uh we're we're looking at another rate increase yeah I mean, we've got several mandates coming down from the state with uh they want us to replace what's called our clear well that's a 20 million dollar project 10 million dollars a year over two years well you know here's the thing mark i mean if the state wants us to continue doing these things how much money do they think that people have in their pocketbooks I mean, you know, these are state mandated things. Let them give back more of our damn shared revenue so that these things can be paid for. Or better yet, let them just pay for it. Well, thanks since for they not, want it done. Thanks for not shooting the message around this one. But it, 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 you know, part of we own part of it because the mains are our our responsibility. And when we have, you know, when we're digging up the streets, we're looking at it. We've got we still have a number of mains that predate 1920. And so when we're doing those streets, we have to consider doing those. Mm -hmm. um, generally, you can get 75 years out of water mains. So it's not that 100 is super old, but it's, it is past the life. If we're doing a project in the water main 70 years old, we're going we're gonna to replace it. Mm -hmm. But I think the youngest water main I've seen replaced has been maybe 50 years old. So we, we do get our life out of it, but... Yeah. We didn't do them for so many years, and there were some places we did we did streets, but not the water, or we do the water and just do a partial patch, and we suffered for that. Now we're doing what I call comprehensive streets, and a lot of people say, "Why are you doing this street? This street is not as bad. Oregon Street is not as bad as many other streets, but our sewer is in rough shape, and it's." Uh, and we have to accommodate growth as we go to the south. Yeah. There's a little bit of growth going there. So the water rates, yeah, we're, we're looking at increases there. Um, we try to moderate those, but it's all based on the value of our system. So as we increase the value of our system, it's all a function of a return on our investment. So it's, it's a very simplified way of saying, 
How much return should we get? And generally, the, the uh, Public Service Commission says we should get about 8% return on our investment. Now, that's so that we can reinvest in. It's not that we're making a profit. We, we're a nonprofit entity. But it's all based on return on our investment, our value. So the more value we put in the ground, the, the higher return we need in dollars. Okay. Um, so that's, that's why we're working on that. The, um, the Clearwell is a classic debate of public agencies. The DNR has told us that we must replace our Clearwell, and the Public Service Commission says, whoa, wait a minute, why are you doing this? And we're like, you got to be kidding me. You know, your, your other agency said we have to fix it. Well, we think this is overkill. Well, tell the DNR. No, that's your problem. It's like, wait a minute, you, you're the guys in Madison. Why don't you talk to each other you can and tell us what you decide? You can rarely win against the DNR. Yeah. And, and the, <laughs> you and can the, rarely win against but them. But the Public Service Commission stopped us. We're like, okay, we'll do it the way the DNR tells us. And the Public Service Commission said, well, this is overkill. I was like, well, we agree that it's overkill, but so tell the DNR how much we should do. Oh, that's your problem. Yeah. So we're going back and forth. The Clearwell project was actually supposed to be done two years ago. We're still going back and forth in the bureaucracy to get this resolved. This is just one more thing that where I said, like uh, before, the state mandates come down the pike, and they mandate what you need to do and must do. It's not yeah. a should do. It's a you must do this, you will do this, but they give you no money with which to do it. And so once again, it's balanced on your back, my back, everybody in this room, yeah, and, we have to and, collect in this it. building, on their backs. And, you know, you're taxing, not you, but the state is taxing people out of their homes with all this stuff. You know, give us back our shared revenue and and at least give us that to help offset a little bit of this anyway. Yeah. You know, it's it's ridiculous. Um they're telling me we've got limited time here. Okay. So I want to I want to move on um bring us up to date on the former Pioneer Inn property. What's happening there? Um my understanding is that uh, Art Dumkey has purchased the Pioneer property from uh the Decades Property Group that had owned it for years. Mm -hmm. Um uh, there was a proposal uh, from Art Dumpke to, to on the um, island itself to put in something that's uh, more of a recreational, outdoor recreational, some uh, you know glamping, uh, some fishing areas, um, a little more high high uh, level. Um, I think that that's probably more of an interim type of thing. It's not going to involve a ton of investment but it's to gain activity downtown. Sure. I've had good conversations with, with Mr. Dumpke, and he really wants to try to attract things to the downtown to get, to get young people interested. Um, the marina, he's absolutely in love with. He wants to uh, get the marina back uh, okay. with a tiki bar type of operation over there. Um, that I, the likelihood of that happening, I think, is very high. I, okay. I very, my confidence level is really high on that. The, the glamping and that, we'll see. Um, I think he's looking at different options. And uh, I think people are talking to him and, and suggesting different ideas. Okay. So that's the pioneer. To the west, we're actually going to be uh, demolishing uh, what was known as 43 East 7th and some of the adjoining buildings. We purchased uh, rec, uh, recreational bowling lanes uh, two years ago. And so we're going to be getting uh, uh, getting that down and getting that prepped so that we can put out a request for proposal to have that site redeveloped. And then we'll take proposals and see what people have to say. It'll be everything that's, uh, you know, they're the building at 6th and Pioneer Drive and Main Street. That's okay. Okay. But we're going to be doing things north of 9th. You're going to see some uh, requests for proposal going out probably over the winter and then in spring award something. Okay. I see the talks between the city and the school district are still going on about this busing of some of these students who are kind of falling through the cracks and um, who don't live in the country, so they're not eligible for busing per se, but trying to get them on city buses to get to school. Um, what What is happening with that? What Where are we at? We're going to be meeting with the school district. Okay. You know, Cheryl, I have a fiscal responsibility um, in my position. And while I think that the council has an interest in doing that, I have to make sure it's fair 
to the city of Oshkosh. Mm -hmm. The school district provides free busing to its rural students. And so I think the school district bears some responsibility for busing for their urban students. Okay. That's a, a just very simplified approach. Okay. Are we totally out of the area of responsibility? No. There are kids and we need to take care of them. Okay. Um, so I think we're going to have a, res a discussion about that in terms of what's fair to do it. Um, I think there's a strong desire for it. Most cities uh, that have done this have the school districts paid for it. So that's my other argument. Okay. Um, but I'm open-minded enough to say, look, we, we know that this is something that both the council and the school board are interested in doing. So it's really just a matter of uh, doing it in a, in, a, in a fiscally responsible fashion. So uh, I suspect something will happen. Um, I'd put it better than 50-50 that something's going to happen. Uh, how we do This doing, school year or? Uh, I, won't, I won't promise anything okay. like that. Because this but, is the second school year it's been going on now. Yeah. And, <laughs> you know, yeah. It, it, and so, uh, but there's, there's other issues that have come up. And it's like, you know, who's going to pay for it? It always comes down to who's going to pay for it. Yeah. Okay. All right. Um, I want to just um, give folks a couple of uh, pieces of information about some apps that the city uses. Um, first, there is an app called Polco, and you can sign up for that, uh, or you can just let the city email you uh, questions that it has on any, it's a wide variety of stuff that the city may ask your input on. It's totally anonymous, uh, you know, it gives you a chance to have a voice into what's happening in your city. Um, you can go to the city's website, which we can put up right now, and um, you can find Polco. It's P-O-L-C-O. -O. Check it out. The other app is um, C-Click Fix, and that is something where you as a citizen can uh, leverage that app to report problems that you see in the city, Sho uh, walks that haven't been shoveled, uh, grass that's getting too long, people who are storing a lot of unsightly things on their front lawns. Um, you name it, and I've seen it on there. So um, it may not be something that the city can do anything about, but in most cases, I think the city can. And it's your way to do it. Again, you can do it anonymously. Um, but it's a wonderful app, and I highly recommend it. So you can find out about both those on the city's website. And uh, for those who are listening to us on the radio, the city's website is ci.oshkosh.wi.us. Again, that is ci.oshkosh.wi.us. And that is about all the time that I think we have. Well, i got to come back again then, Cheryl. <laughs> That's right. We'll get you back sometime closer to spring or summer. And uh, we can, because there's always a ton of stuff to talk about. Absolutely. So thanks again for being here. You're and happy more... holidays to Thanks you. I know you it sounds too, ridiculous Cheryl. to say that right now, but we're already seeing commercials for Christmas. So. And it's cold enough. It is. We've got snow on the ground. Thanks uh, again to Mark. Thanks to my crew, which is always great. And, of course, to you at home and on the radio uh, for listening and watching us. We will see you next time. Until then, take good care. Keep your eye on us. We've got our eye on Oshkosh.